see people what's going on some people are writing in the chat it's awesome to have you all here i'm going to give a little bit of a plug for our community which is how i met mark because he jumped into the community a few weeks ago and introduced himself and it was one of these ones where i i read his bio this is the power of story and this is the power of the word because i read his bio and i was just like damn this guy is doing some cool stuff we should really have him on a meetup and it's not it's not very common to be honest with you mark i don't do that much but you for some reason instilled this motivation in me that i wanted to reach out and i wanted to make sure that um that we got you on here and now it's it happened so that was very fast it was really quick and i'm i'm excited for that to be happening for those of you that aren't in the community slack i will drop a link to it in the chat right now because it is uh where everything is happening feel free to jump in it and ask questions the beauty of the slack community is there's a lot of people in there and they're really smart they're a lot smarter than i am like mark himself he's in there and there's questions that are going on on a daily basis and so if you have any questions about doing ml ops or setting up your machine learning infrastructure i implore you get in there check out what's going on see what others have to say about how they're doing things we can hopefully start to create some best practices and forms best practices somebody told me the other day they were like i don't like the word best practice uh but we <laughs> we're creating best practices in ml ops because i feel like that is what we're trying to do really we want to make sure that we as a community have some some basic consensus on how things can be run and when there are problems we can reach out to others and so there was some people that <laughs> i see people in the chat saying they love best practices yes <laughs> we need some at least right so there uh, is another just quick fact about the community Slack that I think is really awesome. And it's me tooting my own horn a little bit, but someone that I was talking to today said that they're not very active, like they don't post much, but they have been able to reach out to a lot of people that are very smart, that do show their expertise in the certain fields, and they've been able to get mentors. And that for me just... It warms my heart to hear that, you know, I, it's incredible to hear and see people getting value out of it. And so if you're not in it, jump in it. The link is in the chat. I'll put it in again for all those who just joined us. And uh, yeah, I really am happy to have you here, Mark. For those who don't know, Mark Craddock, and forgive me if I pronounced that wrong, but he's currently, I mean, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us how you've got here. I think we can go ahead and start this. Yes, yeah, we go for yeah. it. Yeah, let's do it, man. And let's yeah, just, so just uh, let us know if you can hear me okay, see me okay. Yeah. And uh, in a minute, I'll share my screen. We'll do a few slides and then we'll do a, we can do a bit of Q&A and a bit of chat. So awesome. I'm Mark Craddock. I'm, I'm currently, uh, well, I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of a company called Jakati or Global Training and Certification. And we're a non-profit and we're specializing in training and certification or developing training and certifications around, you know, ML ops, fin ops, data ops, and DevOps, and um, also strategy, so awardly mapping. Yeah? Um, among other things related to uh, statistics and mobile phone data and all that kind of stuff, but we'll get into a bit of that in a minute. But I was... Um, at the UN for uh, two and a half years or so. And we were um, basically deploying a, a global platform for the United Nations Statistics Division and all the statistical offices globally, so 194 plus uh, offices. And it was a platform to get the, um, or enable the uh, statistic offices to use big data to create official statistics. So if I just uh, get into the slides now, we can uh, get, that in, get into that a bit more. So I'm just going to try and share my slides. Nice. And I, yeah, I mentioned did. to Mark beforehand that I really would love to dive deep onto this whole Warbly Maps thing because I, I've been hearing about it uh, quite a bit recently. And since you have the experience with it, uh, I think it would be really useful for a lot of us to see that and see how you did it. 
So yeah, cool. cool. I see your yeah, screen. I've got, Looks good. Yeah, I've got some slides on that. So uh, there's me. You can find me on Twitter. And actually, if you if you search Google or whatever for me in the UN Global Platform, you'll find there's loads of presentations, slides, uh, books, all sorts of stuff we did over the last uh, last few years. So the vision of the platform was a uh, you know about global collaboration to in uh, you know. Um, harness the power of data for better lives. So all these statistical offices globally, they're all public, you know, they all work for public good and they use statistics to, you know, inform policy, you know, governments and, you know, to make, and, you know, to make better lives. Um, so these were the uh, organizations that were kind of core to the, the global platform. So all these, all the countries and all the different UN uh, groups. Um, I'll share these slides later, but I'm not going to go through them now because there's quite a lot involved. Um, and, you know, some of the, the key elements of the platform was about uh, using big data for official statistics and doing experiments and learning how to use big data to create statistics, but also support, supporting the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So all the members of the UN have signed up to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and there's 17 goals, and they're, you know, they're very large, like, you know, um, by 2030, removing poverty from the world. Yeah, so there's these huge goals, and if you're not, if you're not, if you don't know about it, you can go and find them uh, separately. There's plenty of plenty of information from the UN. But getting into the platform, so it's about you know learning how to use big data, learning how to do the algorithms, the methodologies to use big data to, to create statistics, and the approach we took, um, you know, is the is kind of like a minimal viable platform. You know, the hacker, the hipster, the hustler. I don't know if you can go, and, you can kind of Google that, but basically. Um, uh, you know, we had to kind of minimal viable team, a minimal viable platform, and we kind of um, uh, experimented with different uh, tools and techniques. Um, we made the platform available. We got feedback from the users. We kind of iterated in a kind of agile way. Uh, we made use of commodity uh, infrastructure where available, you know, so cloud cloud services. Um, we'll get into that a bit more when we get into the kind of orderly stuff. And we just kind of did, you know, lots of iteration, focus on user needs and building out the kind of platform. Um, and the, the final platform uh, that we put together for the UN was actually multi-cloud. So it's Amazon, Microsoft, Google and Alibaba. Um, and that's because there's no one cloud that meets all the needs of users globally. And some of that is more to do with geopolitical and security reasons than technology. Yeah. It really do you mind doesn't. if I ask you a quick question here yeah, sure yeah the team that put this together how big was it uh five okay but so we, we can talk about when we get into like the um the warning mapping but we had a small core team but there was you know there's many 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 people involved yeah mm -hmm. so i don't know probably 50 plus but the actual core team was was five yeah and you know when i when i started on this there was there were we started with one two people and then we you know we grew to five and, you know, with some of that um, was, you know, administration and working within the UN and dealing with, you know, kind of paperwork and processes and governance. Um, and the technical team, the core team was, you know, uh, four. Yeah. Um, but we, we'll get into that. And one of the key things um, of the UN and the, and the platform is about, about leaving no one behind. And we endeavor to reach the furthest behind first. So the further you are behind, we spend more effort bringing you up, up to the same level of everybody else. Yeah. So to develop the platform, we use the platform business model. Um, so the platform business model, so that's from uh, the, the platform design toolkit. Actually, there's a link there. You'll get that in the slides later. But this is about, um, so there's two things to the platform business model. Uh, when people talk of platforms, they generally think of the digital platform. You know, what's the tech, you know, what's the hardware, what's the kit, what's, is it Amazon, is it Google? But the platform business model focuses on the, the business side of the digital platform. So what is a digital business? You know, what is what is Uber? What is, uh, you know, um, LinkedIn? What, you know, what make uh, Spotify? What makes them a digital business and a digital platform? You know, the eBay's, you know, Amazon. So so this, um, the, the work from Simone and, and, his, and his team, they've basically built a set of templates and knowledge and processes and a framework to kind of understand your user needs and identify the kind of platform. Is it really a platform? And taking into account, you know, the the network effects. So there's a whole lot of uh, separate information on about network effects, the 16 network effects, and how they make and uh, uh, build, build a platform. You know, your business, um, your platform must remove friction from and make it as easy as possible to get onto the platform. Um, and, you know, you, you aggregate the supply and demand. So really uh, a platform business model is a dating site, yeah? How do you how do you um, get people the consumers and the providers? How do you get them together? And how do you build a digital platform to support that kind of digital business model? So basically, all 
pretty much all platforms are dating sites, yeah? So Uber, you get the driver, you set up a date with a person who wants to go somewhere, yeah? So there's a whole raft of information uh, in the platform design toolkit that we used to um, to build out that platform business model, not the digital platform, yeah? The model for the business, yeah? And there's there's a whole load of information from Simone and, and, his, and his team on the platform design toolkit. It's all open source. It's all available for free. Um, and you can, you know, you can use that to understand how to build a platform business model from a business point of view, not a digital platform. Yeah, that sits underneath it. Um, so we did a lot of work with that. And there's a separate podcast that I'm doing with uh, uh, Simone. Um, I'm recording it on Friday, actually, about the actual design and a, a, a platform. So um, the key things about platform, you know, it's the only business model that's able to orchestrate the wide range of uh, products and services into in an ecosystem. Yeah, so you can only build a platform business model around an existing uh, ecosystem. You can't really create a new one from from scratch. Um, so you know, we we you know, for the UN, there's there's lots of people using data, lots of people using kind of big data, creating algorithms, methodology, and the platform business model is the one the way to kind of aggregate everybody together. And it's also one. Um, uh, that allows uh, ecosystems are capable of providing an improbable combination of attributes. So, so from the ecosystem and your platform, it allows other people to do stuff on that platform you probably didn't even think about before. So, uh, Uber Eats on top of Uber, for example, you know that probably wasn't conceived at the beginning, but you know people started doing. And we know in I think in Japan, people just rent Ubers and sleep in them and have lunch in them at lunchtime. Yeah, so this you know this kind of stuff. Yeah, and actually, you you should build your platform for disobedience. So build it so people can do stuff on your platform you don't expect them to do because then that generates new potentially new markets or new new ways of kind of learning about your platform. So, uh, uh, but you know, someone comes a lot of that stuff, uh, and it's also one of the best uh, organizational structures for uh, enabling rapid, rapid evolution. So basically, use your uh, use your customers to understand uh, their you, the, you, your user needs, and as the platform iterates, you kind of um, so a good, a good example, I guess, is if we think of uh, uh, Amazon and they use something called Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize. And actually there's a book, uh, Amazon's latest book is very good. And there's also a section on it on warding mapping and ILC is it called. And if you look at Amazon, they, you know, they built, they start off with interest as service, then they let their um, people come onto that platform. And then they would analyze, they, it's called like a sensing, sensing engine in your platform. And you, un you understand how people are using your platform. Um, so if there's lots of, you know, why is this uh, company over here called Netflix and they're using huge amounts of uh, compute? Why are they doing that? What what user need have they met? Oh, they're they're doing video on demand. Oh, Amazon, right. Why don't we build a service similar to that? Or why don't we try and buy Amazon or whatever? And if you look at Amazon, they do tend to eat their customers, yeah, because they're evolving up the stack and uh, they're using their platform to understand and to meet the user needs so they don't have to invest all that time they get their, their customers to invest on that time and then they basically steal it yeah so that's called uh about innovate and leverage commoditize but you can that's a whole separate thing but you know that's kind of you know one of the ways platforms operate and work yeah so our tra technology strategy so we use wardy map so you can find simon on twitter um and this is the wardy map for the platform this is the kind of the, one of the original maps we did over two years ago um, I don't. Can you see my cursor on the map? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, the maps are made up of um, four phases. So, on the left hand side, you have uh, the genesis. On the right hand side, you have a commodity utility, and you have kind of custom built and a product. So, things on the left hand side that are genesis, so they're new, novel, unique. They haven't been done before. This is not, you know, oh, we haven't rolled out Windows ten, so we need to roll it out. You know, this is uh, create a new. Um, uh, what you call it, uh, vaccine for COVID. Yeah. You know, this has never been done before. Yeah. This is new novel, not been done. And on the right hand side, you have utility and commodity. So, um, uh, you know, electricity, water, um, and now compute, you know, cloud compute that, uh, you know, Amazon led, led, you know, led that. And we, you know, we've got that from Amazon, Microsoft, Google and Alibaba. And, um, the custom built is things you kind of things that are built, yeah. You you build yourself, and then products or you know rental. I know, say you know, it could be you know lots of you know cots type stuff. So maybe office, um, Microsoft Office, Excel, that kind of stuff. But also you know custom um, products you can go and buy, you know off off the shelf, yeah. Not necessarily you know office products TV, but any any product you buy, yeah. So it could be a car, yeah, for example. But would the, and would this be where like machine learning tools would fit in? 
Well, so th this is this is the map we did two and a half years ago. So if we look at the the stuff in commodities, so like analytics, so it was big data, data warehouse, and data import, you know, ETL, and your kind of storage in your your infrastructure. So this was two years ago, and we've got these kind of so in our product, we've got our data science, you know, ID, you know, integrated development environment, so um, mm -hmm. Jupyter uh, type stuff. We got our orchestration of that environment, so that really was getting into like you know using Kubernetes and those types of technologies. And if we look at this map, so two years ago, we said, you know, like containers and kind of Kubernetes. Um, it's currently like a, a product. Um, so you have, you, know, you have to get the product, you have to go and, um, you know, build it, configure it yourself and, you know, build your services. But using this map, so everything on a Wardley map moves from left to right. And this is kind of predictable. Um, you can look at kind of uh, signals as simon says and you can understand where things are moving but they move left to right and everything moves mm -hmm. all technology moves left to right so if we had the original cars so the first car was created it would be in genesis then everybody started building their own cars you know uh three wheels two wheels whatever um and then they turn into products and now we're seeing cars move into the commodity utility space where you know you will pay you know three hundred dollars a month and an Uber will just turn up when you need one or your car will turn up when you need one. Yeah. And you'll never end up buying a car again. You'll always kind of be in a pay per use model and you'll, you know, you pay generally with your credit card. So the stuff on the right hand side is usually pay per use and pay, you know, for you a consumption based. Yeah. Stuff on the left, you know, can get uh, really expensive and, you know, you've got to custom build something. Even when you get into products in, they, they could be, they could be more expensive than you, your utility model. So when it comes down to machine learning and those types of capabilities, and in fact, Kubernetes in this time, so I did a, a presentation at MapCamp 2019 and said, look, we didn't, we can see that containers were going to move to the right and we could see, you know, Kubernetes and was, was going to be available from Amazon, Microsoft, Google and Alibaba as a service. So we don't need to spend money and uh, time, you know, building our own uh, stack. Yeah, we'll just wait for this to be available from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, and we did wait, and we saved probably a million by not doing that because, you know, it was, uh, of building out our own uh, 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 capabilities. And then we just utilized the, the services from Amazon, and Microsoft, and Google, and Alibaba. Huh. Now, if, if, we, if we create a map for machine learning now, so I would say um, the models would be in custom built. The actual machine learning model is custom built but we'll find there's lots of tools and capabilities that are in the commodity space and also in the product. So from this map, uh, we concluded we needed to spend our effort on the, you know, this is where we're going to invest in like the, the data provenance and the, the policy based data sets. And also this um, in this Genesis phase, you can see multi-party authentication, multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption. So these were components we identified we would need in the platform longer term. And these allow you to encrypt data at source, but still do calculations on that data. So you can, you can basically, so if we took a, a poll of everybody on the uh, call now, we got all the heights, we could put it in a database and we could still do calculations like understanding the average height and um, who was the tallest and shortest, et cetera, but it wouldn't reveal any of that data. Okay. You could do the calculation, you can get the average height and you can get the shortest and the, you know, the mean or whatever, but you would never know, you would never see the raw data because it would always always be encrypted and it stays encrypted and you only get the results which are also uh, also can be encrypted as well so um but now these these multi-party computation or more encryption they're more into the product space so there's a uh, spice like um oh what they called out in estonia cybernetica um there's some work um with a company in the us i can't remember what they're called now um and they've got some products and services coming out so so these tech techniques now are more in the product space, so you can you can now um, using Python and PyTorch, you can encrypt data at source, and you can do calculations on this data while it's still encrypted. And if you look at um, there's an open source community called Open Mind, uh, run by Andrew Trask, and there they've actually developed capabilities now, uh, which is all open, all open source, that allows you to take um, your data, source data, encrypt it, and uh, use that encrypted data to build a machine learning model, yeah, which is also encrypted. Yeah, so go in Google Open Mind, uh, join, you know, there's a Slack community there, and they're looking at, um, they're, well, they've developed capabilities to encrypt data at source and build machine learning models using encrypted data. 
Yeah. So you protect the privacy of the individuals. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of getting into the, I would I'd say it's custom built. It's kind of getting into product. So it's, it's one to keep an eye on. Um, and I've, um, I think Andrew's, I think it's today or tomorrow, they're launching their, their um, beta service where you've got a data science capability where you can actually build machine learning models uh, using encrypted data. So they're, they're turning this now into more like a product or a, you know, a, a service and it's moving that kind of way. Well, first of all, that's awesome just to hear about. And the question that I have that instantly jumps into my mind is, are you looking at how fast these are moving across to the right? And how can you gauge that? Yeah, so so Morley Maps will tell you that it's going to move to the right, but we won't tell you how fast yeah. Yeah, and at what time scale. Yeah. So the movement is not, the X axis is not time. Yeah. It's, it's evolution. So you know it's going to move, but you don't know when. Yeah. So we know, um, you know, at the time, you know, blockchain was a product, but we know there's blockchain as a service now. But you couldn't say if, if that was going to be. Uh, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, or six months. But what you generally know is from the Genesis side, on the left-hand side to the commodity, it's tens of years. So it's 20, 30 years, yeah, hmm. in general, yeah. Um, but what we are finding now with the with um, services that are built on top of like um, infrastructure service, I, you know, you can see these moving a lot, lot quicker. So the, you know, from Kubernetes um, and containers, you know, and Docker, Docker and Kubernetes being, you know, open source and uh, you, had, you had to custom build it all yourself. Then it kind of, you were kind of getting these kind of products based on it. And now it's services available from, you know, Amazon and, you know, Google and Microsoft. Um, you knew that was going to happen, but it wasn't taking, it wasn't going to take five or 20 years. You know, it was probably going to take, you know, maybe 18 months or something like that. Yeah. But, and I think that just comes from experience in looking at the kind of signals of what's going on and maybe, you know, seeing roadmaps. I know the, a lot of the cloud providers don't produce roadmaps, but you can see what kind of people they're hiring, what kind of job specs they're putting out. Yeah. Um, the you, size you of the community, the, the activity kind of, of the community, I imagine that's behind it. Like if you look at Kubernetes community, you say, wow, okay, there's things that are happening here. Yeah, yeah, and if and if you look at you know um, Andrew's Open Mind community, you know there's five and a half thousand people in there, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there's thousands of commits to the the code and the software, so you know that's pretty substantial and that's pretty you know that, you know that's moving, yeah? yeah, that's definitely moving to the right at you know at pace, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and you know if we look at our other you know ML ops, so you know we got like a cube flow. So I would say, you know, again, you know, you've got like Kubeflow, you've got these type of services sitting on top of, you know, cloud. Uh, personally, I would wait because they're going to move to the right and Amazon's going to release something in Google. You know, probably Google, I, I think, you know, the kind of the data stuff's probably better from Google at the moment, but, you know, that's my personal opinion. But, you know, we'll see these services and we'll see better service from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google um, in the near future. You don't need to build your own Kubernetes stack with your kind of ML on top. And at, you know, today we used at the plat, you know, the UN Global Plat, we used um, Algorithmia. So again, you know, Algorithmia, they've done all the hard work of Docker in the containers and Kubernetes. Um, and it's, you know, it sits on top of uh, Amazon. Or we, we deployed it on top of that. I say we deployed it on top of Amazon, but, uh, you know, uh, Algorithmia did. And I think that was probably worth talking about that. So we, you know, we, we used Algorithmia because it, it makes us, uh, from a statistics point of view, you can take, um, uh, data and algorithms and we can custom build them but we can deploy them and we can turn those into a commodity kind of instantly because it takes that machine learning model sticks an api in the front of it and it makes it available as a as a service yeah or an, an api so you can you can take uh, you can build a machine learning model for um i don't know um i see joe um is in the community i've seen joe did some work with building some models that we deployed with algorithm yeah mm -hmm. and one model we um he did was uh, counting trees along streets so we used um uh, data from google uh, we pulled you know we pulled in the street view data then he ran through a machine learning model to identify um, the, i mean how green the street was and he he built that out using a you know pipeline algorithm here and um so you know the work most of the work joe did was building the machine learning model not you know deploying kubernetes or kubeflow or you know any of that kind of stuff and basically within days you know well weeks um, you know, th this uh, this was available as a as an API, and you could just put in any street or postcode, and it would automatically tell you how much greenness was along the along that route. 
So, you know, so by, by drawing a map, you can understand, you know, that, you know, you know, Kubernetes and, um, uh, you know, the, the ML ops type tools, they're going to move really quickly to the right. Um, you know, we can see that. And I think there's, you know, there's a good quote from Liam, Liam Maxwell that, you know, no cloud, no AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to, if you're building this in your own data center, you're, you're mad. Yeah. You're crazy. You'll, you'll probably, you'll never have enough compute or, or processing. You'll never be able to adapt quick enough. You'll never be able to change quick enough to kind of do this, you know, in, in your own environment. You need to be doing this in the cloud, yeah? And, um, and you know, for us, we used Algorithmia, and it saved us a ton of uh, effort and time. And, you know, when, when it was actually, and we deployed it into our own Amazon um, account, your own, in, I say own instance of Amazon, but it was our own Amazon account. Um, and I remember, you know, the, the guys from Algorithmia, yeah, we, we logged in, did a shared screen. They just asked us five questions. I know what what um, region do you want it in? What do you want it called? I know a couple of other questions. And it just ran this script and it just deployed the whole thing, you know, into Amazon for us. And I think it was a couple of hours later after the script ran, it was ready to run. You know, it was ready up and up and up and running. Yeah. And then, you know, these are the things, you know, we should be looking at because, you know, if Algorithmia could do that two years ago, you know, what are they doing now? Where are they going with ML ops? And it's you know it's just an algorithm. There are, you know there are, there are others as well, um, but you know that that's kind of what you can learn and understand from a, a Wardley map. Is that I mean is that enough on Wardley or do we? Yeah, do just one more? last question. And yeah. if anybody else has any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat. Or if you want me to shut up and stop asking questions about Wardley, <laughs> throw it in the chat. Also, I know that you all are a, a honest bunch, so feel free to put it in. I'm just wondering about the value and how you decided the value of each of these, because obviously I understand the left to right part, but the value and, and does that go, is that very fluid also? Yeah, or so, is it, so, uh, so you're, you're mapping the, the, the value chain. So what's the value between components? So there's always some value between components. It could be money, it could be capital, or in some case with users, it could be trust. Um, it could be knowledge, you know? So there's some some link between the components, and it all maps should be uh, anchored on the user and the user need. Yeah. So what's the user need? So we've got these high level green blobs at the top about you know data processing, data visualization, and data publishing, um, and the user needs are you know they need to process data, to create visualizations, you know, create statistics, and then publish that. Um, so the the top of the y axis is what's most visible to the user. Yeah. And at the bottom is what's not visible, yeah. So there's is a sign of visibility, yeah. And it's 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 rude. Um, it's not set in stone. So you know, from a from the our user needs, you know, their data science ID was really important to them. You know, that's what they see. That's what they log into. That's how they access you know data and and the compute. Um, and you know, they don't they don't care about infrastructure as a service or storage, yeah, or the ETL. They they don't really see that. That all those components just kind of work. Yeah. So they, you know, they don't care about containers or uh, Kubernetes or any, any of that kind of stuff. You know, they don't really care. It could, you know, they didn't care if it was running on Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba. Yeah. All they cared about was their need to, you know, write some code, build some machine learning models, build some algorithms, et cetera. So you're looking at this for the end user. You're building this platform for the end user. And I imagine you had different, like, personas that you were yep, looking yep, at yeah and how did you factor that in uh yeah so so there was a there was a whole piece of work um done on the user needs so talking i think we talked to over 400 different people globally and we produced um a range of personas um and their needs yeah and then we use those needs to you know create the maps um so th there's many many maps uh for the un yeah uh, this is just one I used to talk about. This is one of the first maps I we created, and actually the the you know the later maps are even they're better, yeah, <laughs> and they follow the style of of, of wardy mapping, etc. But yeah, so so you know it's um so if you think of Uber, you know what's the user need there? I I want to get somewhere really quick, yeah, um or I want to get to somewhere. I want to get to a, a to b, yeah. And how do you how do you do that? So if you if you map out the components of getting a to b, I need I need some kind of transport. I need I need to know where I am. I need to know where I want to go. Oh, that sounds like a map. Yeah. Um, oh, how do I access that? Oh, it sounds like a mobile device would be good. You know, I need me location data. You know, I need to know where the car, you know, 
where's the car you know or where's the where's the they're not every cars now you know uh, uh bikes or scooters or you know so how do you know the so the user need there is about you know getting to a to b and how do you meet those needs with and what components do you need to meet those needs yeah so that you know the future of uber is obviously not uh no taxi drivers yeah they're going to be self-driving cars mm -hmm. uh, and you can draw that in a warning map and you can you know pretty much if you're an uber driver it's you know there's a it's a limited career yeah because the cars are going to be self-driving at some point yeah in the future but we don't know when but we know it will happen from mapping that on a warning map yeah mm -hmm. so the other thing that i was thinking about is like how do you enable loosely coupled teams with this and how do you make sure that like if somebody wants to do it a certain way and they want to use a certain tool or they like they have their opinions on a certain yeah. kind of um, way that it should be done, how do you enable this and encompass that? Right. So there's, I guess there's two parts to the answer. There's one, um, so Simon talk, Wardy talks about inertia. So on the four phases, when you move between phases, you have inertia. Yeah. So there'll be some reason, you know, the sky's blue, I have sugar in my coffee, whatever it is, that you cannot move to the next phase. So if we look at our, you know, date, current people that, you know, rack and stack uh, stuff in data centers, you know, there's inertia to go into the cloud. Yeah. Because, um, you know, they're, they're losing um, visibility of the servers. They like to hug them. Yeah. Um, and they can't do that anymore. So they'll they'll come up with loads of reasons why you can't go to cloud. Uh, it's not secure. It's too expensive. Um, we don't we don't we can't see our data. What if we need to get our data back? Yada yada yada. Right. And that there'll be loads of reasons for inertia. And uh, Simon's got a separate uh, uh, piece of the framework really that uh, tells you how to handle the inertia. So there's six, I think there's 16 different forms of inertia and there's, there's some recommendations how you can handle all the different forms, but some of it is about, you know, uh, losing control, losing power. Um, some of it's, you know, about, uh, you know, trust, etc. So, and every phase, when, when you move between phases, there's always inertia. So if you go from customer build to product, you know, we're going to build our own, uh, word process. Uh, we're going to build our own data center. Why don't we just go and rent some space? Oh, we can't do that because we don't trust them. You know, the sky's blue. We have sugar and a coffee. We can't move between phases, yeah? Or we want to move from uh, renting space, co-location to cloud. We can't do this because, 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 yeah? And that's inertia. And that's, mm. um, there'll, there'll always be inertia. And there are some techniques to overcome inertia. Um, but generally, the biggest forms of inertia are between phases, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll always see it. Um and the the other part, oh, teams, yes, yeah? so teams. So wardly mapping can also be used to understand and organize your teams. Yeah. So let's take this map for example. The proof of concept on the right, so you know, data warehouse, big data, data import, ETL. That was one team, one proof of concept, uh, because this team needs different types of skills and capabilities than the teams on the left. So this is rolling out something that's kind of known, well understood. It's already built. Yeah. So you need someone who can. You know, use a SaaS service or an IaaS service and configure it. It's more, more the doing, not the more the gluing, not the doing. Yeah, yes. What we, uh, I mean, uh, Martin O'Brien, uh, uh, came up with. But um, so you need people who can like uh, glue stuff together and do stuff. Yeah, you don't want somebody who wants to rack and stack a server, install Windows, you know, two thousand or whatever, and blah blah blah. Right. You need somebody who can take an existing service and glue it together with other bits and pieces. Yeah, and that's one type of person. And on the left-hand side, you know, it's this custom built, you know, the say this green blob, you know, this is all kind of new and novel. It needs someone to kind of build it and understand it. They might need to write some code. They might, you know, uh, I don't know. They might need some HTML, CSS, but they, they need to take these kind of new novel stuff and kind of work with them. So, you know, they need to accept and be used to working with failure. They need to, you know, be used with, used to change. They need to kind of be reactive. They know when they know how to fail fast and fail forward. You know, they're, they're a different type of person. Yeah? And this is how you can look at your teams and the and and the capabilities you need in your teams. So there's a whole whole section on warding mapping on that. And there's also the section on pioneer settlers and town planners, but we probably haven't got time to go through that. Um, this but, is fascinating. This but is the, so the cool. thing the, the thing to start with before you kind of look at that is is the kind of doctrine. So there's a whole range of doctrine from Simon and this kind of universal doctrine. And it's about, you know, start with user needs. You know, um, 
uh, think big, act small. Yeah. So there's a whole range of them. Um, so, and once you get your kind of doctrine in place, then you can start thinking about, you know, moving on to more advanced techniques of strategy and pioneer settler town planner. Yeah. Ah. So there's a whole range of uh, uh, stuff from Simon on that. Yeah. So we've got a question coming through in the chat and Jonathan, yeah. thanks for asking this awesome question. He's saying you have data models and classifications and quality in custom built. Is this because the data becomes part of the data library catalog over time? And therefore data models classifications replaces old with new. And so it's ever present in the custom build and never moving into the product, i.e. there's no rightward movement. Right, yeah, so good question. Very good. So, so data also moves from left to right, yeah? So data can be new, unique, novel, not understood. I don't know, let's, I don't know, a bunch of data from self-driving cars. I don't know. Uh, uh, data from COVID trials, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. And data will move from left to right as well. So, so data, um, so it, it's basically, uh, what do we say? So all data is structured, right? There's no such thing as unstructured data, right? All data has structure to it. So let's take, you know, video. Yeah, it has a structure, yeah, but it's not modeled, so we don't understand it. So data will move from unmodeled to modeled, yeah, um, and move from left to right. Now, all data will do that, and all data will move at a different pace. And we can take, so some data, let's say a uh, name and address, location, whatever, is well known, well understood, well defined, yeah, so that would be on the right hand side. But let's say uh, data from a uh, point cloud from a uh, LIDAR from a self-driving car, you know, it's not well known, well understood. It's not well defined. I mean, maybe with inside, you know, Uber and Tesla it is, but, but not, you know, not for everybody else. Yeah. And you need, you'll need different techniques. You need different tools. So, you know, you, not one tool, you know, work is, you can't buy one tool or one technique that you can work with data from left and right. You know, there isn't one. Yeah. So you need to understand that, you know, and the you know the people working with data on the left hand side and the people working with data on the right hand side were probably different people and have different you know uh, ways of seeing the world. So you know on the left you know, um, and I think you know maybe later we get into it, but you know we we looked at our data for the global platform and we identified you know we try to use data from the right hand side so it's well defined, well understood. So and you can you kind of kind of get some quick wins there. So if it's well known and well understood by the provider of the data then you can consume that data as a service. So we, we took a couple of um, data streams into the platform, yeah? And they were kind of well-defined, well-understood from the provider's point of view. So there's some really good stuff from ThoughtWorks on about, you know, looking at kind of data as a service and getting away from this kind of um, uh, data warehousing and data lakes and all that kind of stuff. Because they, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's got a successful data lake, but you tend to get loads of different data. You're pulling it in a big lake, a pool, and you take data from other places and you spend ages just trying to understand it because yeah? you don't know the data because it's not your data. Um, so it's better to, for the person who owns the data to put it in a structured form or, or a, a, a version that you can consume and then you consume that data. Then you, you spend less time trying to understand it and you end up, you do more kind of linking the data and, and you, you'll find the data has more utility than if you... Um, try and get a big bundle like you put it into a big data warehouse or a data lake and you you'll spend two years trying to understand it and then you realize you don't need this data or that data and you know it ended up being a bit of a uh bit of a mess but i think uh full works probably explain that a lot better than i can uh, so i'd go and look at that apology uh but yeah so data moves from left to right so in this case um what we're talking about here is our statistical methods um they're custom built so they're custom built by the stats offices to um, the methods and algorithms so to to look at uh, some data and turn that into an official statistic and there's the, there's a huge amount of rigor put over that than you would normally do in probably a commercial organization uh, because you know this informs government policy and spending and funding it's got to be kind of right yeah um, so that's well that's well defined uh, that's um, sorry that's all custom built the, st the quality standards are custom built and the metadata standards so they're all custom built uh, within the statistical offices and they always will be yeah but the use of those standards could move from left to right yeah so they're custom built here but they could get used um they will be consumed yeah 
um, by data from the left to right, if I kind of made sense there. I'd do, <laughs> yeah. Um, and this other stuff, we were looking at policy-enabled data sets and data provenance in multi-body data vaults. That's about um, getting data from different places um, and making it available um, and sorting out the utility of the data. So the data can be used for purposes, yeah, and many, many different purposes. And that's where we spent some time looking at. And that's where the, the encryption techniques came in because um, for Cisco offices using consuming big data, um, in general, governments um, and Cisco offices don't own or have big data. Yeah, they're consumers of big data because the big data is produced by everybody else. Yeah, you know, satellite imagery, mobile phone data, etc. It's all produced and owned by someone else, so they have to consume it. So, um, and we looked at these techniques of encryption to make it easier for uh, commercial um, and other organizations to share data that they probably wouldn't normally share because they were sharing encrypted form, not the kind of open readable form. So if they share the encrypted form and we could do calculations on the encrypted data, it would be more likely they would share the data than sharing their, you know, original source data. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of kind of where it's getting to now with the stuff that if you look at the stuff from, you know, Andrew Trask and Open Mind, um, and also from like uh, Cybernetica, and Gawa in the US. Well, just remember the name. Yeah. So they, nice. you know, they've they've all got these kind of tools and techniques, right? So well, yeah. So data moves left to right as well. But um, I think I might have some slides on that later. But if you look at the stuff I did at MapCamp, I do probably some talk on how data moves left to right, and also how the algorithms and methodologies move left to right as well. So it, you know, it changes over time. Yeah. So I think we've we've beat a dead horse enough. This was. <laughs> Yep. really insightful i thank you for the worldly maps deep dive right now and i see somebody just posted in slack too that there's a whole active community around that which i'm gonna go and join right now yeah 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 that's, that's a good that's a really good community yeah so we so we move on <laughs> <laughs> right so as part of that we we create a handbook with the un or you know the un create a handbook on warding mapping and how to use it in your it strategy there's a link to the handbook we'll share it all later but it covers you know Map in the landscape talks about cloud and machine learning, big data, serverless. Um, we've, oh, these were a lot of achievements we did. Um, probably not really relevant to anybody, except we won we won some awards, or Joe won some awards. I think Joe's part of the community, actually. Yeah. So you can uh, find Joe. Yeah. Um, the other thing we did was kind of like a FinOps thing. So, you know, where do we deploy the compute? So if you've got a global platform and you're doing some machine learning or, you know, uh, why deploy it in Germany, which is 20% more expensive than the West Coast of the US, yeah? You know, deploy it in the cheapest regions, use the right type of um, Amazon instances and Google, you know, and just basically use, you know, put some analysis into it and use, you know, the best uh, or, you know, financial savvy about where you deploy your compute and your storage and basically, you know, make sure you get the best buck, yeah? There's a this lot is what kind of our global you... billing did. That is like a huge topic. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole just... FinOps stuff. Yeah, yeah. whole separate thing yeah, on FinOps. Completely. Yeah. Uh, that is a fascinating topic too. But I'll I'll keep you on track. I want yeah, to that's really yeah. So privacy techniques. We kind of talked about that quite a lot. So this is about multi-party computation, fully more fixed, zero knowledge proof. But this is about encrypting data at source and still being able to do calculations on the data. Yeah. And there's a handbook we produced on that. That's got quite a few Wardley maps in it. And we talk about the techniques at that time. They've moved, you know, moved to the right a bit. But it allows you, you know, some of the kind of use cases about using data, you know, prime, you know, sensitive data in, you know, healthcare, uh, trade, trade statistics. There's also a piece of work we were doing at the UN on creating synthetic data using machine learning models. Um, so you could take um, some sample mobile phone data, for example, and you could create a synthetic data set that protects the privacy of people, but it looks like a genuine data set that you could use for other techniques and uh, training, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, funny you should mention that just because we started a podcast around data privacy. Uh, just this week, we launched it. I don't know if you saw it, but it is coming from uh, a company that sponsored it is a synthetic data company. So if anyone out there has not seen it, go check it out. Yeah, and Otherwise, you, you... Yeah, and there's some work done by the Office of National Statistics in the UK looking at uh, creating synthetic data for the for the UK census um, and, and a couple other things as well. So um, but all, all that's online and it's open. Um, 
Yeah, so, oh yeah, big data. Is, I, I don't know, I got a little bug thing about it. You know, it's not big unless it's got a billion in it. I think, you know, people are bigging up big data when they're not actually using big data. But anyway, um, and the, the challenge that we talked about earlier is, you know, most big data is created by someone else or it is for the statistical community. And the challenges of accessing the data, yeah. So and most, I would say a lot of big data is already in the cloud. So it comes down to about access to the data, not about making a copy of it and, you know, kind of... Um, yeah, well, basically making a copy of it, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the assumption there is that, you know, big data will be, if it's not in the cloud, it will be hosted in the cloud. Oh, well, this is the bit I was talking about, you know, from ThoughtWorks about the data mesh architecture. So this is where your data is available as a service, not um, your kind of data warehouse stuff, yeah. Yeah, and that's something else that I know I've talked to other people about, how in certain countries they have certain data protocol. So, like, for example, in Canada, if you're dealing with PII, I think that data can't yeah. leave Canada. So how do you, like, you have to factor that in, I imagine, and you're looking at those things too. Yep. Sorry, my daughter just walked in. Uh, What'd you want? Um, Can we say hello? This is the beauty of <laughs> 2020. Do you want to whisper it or do you want to talk to me later? Is it urgent or not? No, it's not. Right, go away. <laughs> right, sorry. I was we'll going to say that. Out, yeah? <laughs> For all Ooh, of those... Hello, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel right, a little yeah. bit... I feel for people who don't have English as their first language because you speak it a mile a minute. And <laughs> for those, I can I can feel for everyone that is trying to translate this into, in, into oh, right, yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I'll let you get back to your rapid fire. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, you know, they can watch it back later. They can slow it down a bit, you know. Um, uh, yeah. And the, I mean, the other thing now, even Garner is saying, you know, the data should be, uh, you know, you should be moving, putting your data in the cloud now because, you know, um, why, why not? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so getting onto the global platform. So we uh, we had three big data sets. So ADSB records is flight data. So every every plane. Uh, broadcast via radio signal, it's kind of lo location, it's kind of ID, uh, speed, altitude, etc. So we uh, get this data from an aggregator called the ADSB Exchange, and we had a uh, 100 million, no, 100, 100 billion records uh, in in the platform that were used for analyzing flight data uh, for all various types of reasons. Um, and also the AIS records with ships. So ships over a certain length by law has to broadcast a radio signal saying the ship ID, where it is, kind of heading, speed, et cetera. And um, so the AIS data, you know, it's 40 million records a day. So this is data streamed into the platform every day, 40 million records on the ship, the location. And this was analyzed by various different uh, uh, services on top of that data. So the MEFA service was actually, you know, kind of algorithmia. Our location analytics service was used to um, analyze anything that moves. Yeah, so you can create statistics on movement, um, and the you know, or you could just use you know, kind of Jupyter notebooks and a bit of R or Python to access the data. It's also available via APIs, and the ADSB. So the the flight record data is six hundred million records a day. So I think there's a, a wow. I don't know, was it eight or 10,000 flights? Used to, well, there used to be about eight or 10,000 flights in the air, mm -hmm. and they were broadcast every few seconds of their location, speed, altitude, et cetera. All that data was collected, aggregated, and then streamed into the platform. Um, and that data was kind of analyzed. Oh, we can talk about that in a sec. And then also we got loads of satellite imagery, which is kind of open and uh, was available in the clouds anyway, so you just kind of access it. Um, and just quickly on satellite imagery, if you want to do anything clever with this satellite imagery, you know, start looking at the geointelligence uh, markets because uh, there's lots of good work going on there. And also, um, if you're into cloud and geospatial imagery, look at COGS, so the Clouds Optimized GeoTIFFs and Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog Stack. And the guy called Chris Holmes has a very good presentation on that from uh, Planet. Uh, these were the services in the platform. Uh, you can look at them later. Uh, so the location analytics, so let's get into the kind of like, this is more data ops than NML ops. But basically the stack um, uses a GeoMesa, an Apache, you know, NiFi, Kafka, HBase, Spark, and Jupyter and GeoServer. So this is where the data is streamed in. Um, and if you actually, uh, there's a report from DSTL, which is the data, they're basically like the data science arm of the MLD, the uh, of the um 
of the army and the navy in the in the UK, yeah. And they did a, 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 a some performance testing of various different open source and closed source uh, geospatial services that you could analyze uh, movement and location information. And pretty much, um, you know, GeoMessive came out as one of the top. Um, but the report's there in the link, so you can go and read that for yourself. And this is kind of the stack, yeah. So we've got um, for the ADSB data. There's um, a Raspberry Pi using software defined radios collecting the radio signals, and these are all kind of volunteers around the world collecting this data from radio. This gets uh, streamed into the into a cluster and onto you know Amazon's uh, EC2, and then it gets stored in Redshift and um, and and uh, Amazon S3 for back and ar archive, <clears throat> and then that gets streamed into our platform. <clears throat> so all the data streaming, we use Apache and iFi. <clears throat> Uh, to you know, collect the data, move it around. So if you haven't come across, hang on a minute, I'll just drink. <laughs> yeah, this is really useful information. And talk right. about scale. <clears throat> yeah, so Apache NiFi was developed by the NSA, <clears throat> NSA in the UK, uh, US. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. No worries. Take a minute if you need it. <clears throat> Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So Apache NiFi, <clears throat> short for Niagara Files, uh, was developed by the NSA <clears throat> in the US for basically collecting data, data off the internet, uh, street, you know, uh, process, you know, ETL, and processes it and storing it. <clears throat> but they open sourced it, so we used Apache NiFi to collect the data, <clears throat> stream it into the platform, and it was split into two uh, two streams: one for Kafka, one for the live. <clears throat> Uh, tool called uh, Stealth to visualize data, and the one that you know put it into HBase for storage and analysis later. And uh, I mean, this is like the Apache NIFI file, NI file uh, configuration. So basically, you get these um, <clears throat> individual components and you link them together. So it's kind of flow based programming. So this is collecting the TCP, TCP uh, data stream. This is splitting out the JSON into various into individual JSON files. Uh, doing some evaluation on it, then um, basically storing that data, putting that data out to uh, GeoMesser or to, or to Kafka. And this so, is how you enabled reproducibility? Was this part of that whole, like the data lineage? Yes, yeah. So so the one thing that uh, uh, Apache NiFi gives you is the lineage. So you can see every piece, piece of data <clears throat> that's come into your platform. You know, where did you collect it? What did you do to that data? So every single... Uh, operation component on this um, uh, data flow, you get a full audit trail. So you know where the data come from, what you did to the data, how did you modify it, all that gets logged. And you can, you know, you can go back and look at the, you know, your, your providence of the data. How, how did you collect it? Where did, what did you do to it? Yeah. So that's, you know, that's really powerful in uh, Apache NiFi. You know, and, and the NiFi scales, uh, massively, you know, so we're, you know, we're streaming 600 million records in a day. Um, uh, yeah, so the location service, we use that, you know, for analyzing it for uh, producing official statistics. So, you know, a good example. <clears throat> so using the, this uh, UN Global Platform, when COVID kicked off, the platform was used to analyze flights out of China. Where, where were they going? And that was used to identify in, you know, kind of in advance or give some early warning of which countries would, you know, potentially get more COVID cases than others, for, uh, for example. And it's also used um, for the ship data. So when we had the financial crash in 2008, um, at the time, people saw there was just less ships, cargo ships moving around, but they didn't know why. And the reason was, you know, because people weren't buying stuff. They weren't, you know, sh they didn't, ships didn't need to move. Um, so it was a good indicator of economic, you know, pending doom, basically. So within this platform, you know, as soon as the COVID thing kicked off, <clears throat> there was some analysis from various different countries looking at ship data, looking at cargo coming out of China. You know, is it the same level? Is it stopped? Um, and that was used as an economic indicator. And for the UK, you know, that's probably saved the UK about 12 billion. Yeah. In uh, wow. the UK economy was saved about 12 billion by... Um, understanding what the impact to the economy would be, you know, 
understanding that it was happening and providing that as figures to our, you know, the Bank of England, the UK, and the Treasury, and the you know central government. So then they can make policy decisions and uh, put uh, you know stuff in, in into effect that you know could um, lessen the impact of of COVID, yeah, and the economic impact. And it's also used by the, you know, it's used by the Federal Reserve Bank plus many of many other countries to analyze the, um, you know, the flight and ship data because you know it was there available in the platform and you, you know, you could kind of do any kind of analysis that uh, you prefer. Yeah, uh, and here's a kind of example of the visualization. So here you can see the uh, the green is the ships and you can you can see the shipping lanes, yeah, that we all talk about, but you don't really know what they are. And the blue was the flights at this particular time. Um, here's the ships around Shanghai, um, mainly, you know, oh, no, sorry, flights around Shanghai. So you can see the flights, you can see the um, holding pattern, you know, around the airports. You can see the flights coming in, in and out of the airport. This is the cargo ships coming out of Shanghai. You know, you can see ships coming out. There's lot, all, most of the ships kind of sat outside this area, just sat there. And they can sit there for weeks sometimes waiting for cargo. But you can see they come in to pick, you know, pick the goods up and then off, off they go. And you can kind of map that globally. So that's kind of the global platform very quickly. Yeah. But there's a lot to it. Um, wow. So any any more questions? Yeah. I'll stop sharing. I'll keep, my, I'll keep sharing my screen because I need to flip back to any of the slides. Yeah. Yeah. For me, this has been incredibly eye-opening. And it's obvious that you've you've got some serious experience. And I really appreciate that you come and you share it with us because this is awesome, man. I really, really enjoyed this talk and just how you viewed things and the scale that you were operating on is is very commendable. It's it's very, very interesting to hear how you look at things when you're dealing with that big of a scale. So for me, I'm good. We hit the time. I don't know if anyone wants to throw in any, any last minute questions in. Otherwise, awesome. And if anyone wants to talk with Mark, he's in the community or you can find him on Twitter. And yeah, this has been- Yeah, really you know, and, you know, thanks for the opportunity. You know, what we're doing now is, you know, the stuff we learned, you know, from doing this at the UN, now we're, you know, we're building training and education and certifications around kind of, you know, data ops. And we're also looking to do, you know, something around ML ops. So I guess if there's anybody in the community want to work with us and help us, you know, develop some, some training, then, you know, get in touch. That's awesome. That's great to hear too. And I know there are a lot of people that come into the community and they want to know, how can I get hands-on practice? How can I do this hands-on ML ops? Because it is a bit new hmm. and maybe at their job, they don't have the ability to practice these things. So that is really cool. And we will, we will have you back on here once all that is stood up and then you can launch it to the world and we can say this was conceived and built in the ML ops community. So yeah. And, really... you know, I guess, you know, there's a lot of stuff to cover there. I could probably do an hour on, you know, uh, each of the couple of slides or something. Yeah. I could probably, I mean, when we, when we used to brief uh, the country, you would take two full days to kind of go through the platform. Wow. So uh, there's a kind of whistle tour there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That makes sense because it is so, in depth and it is so complicated. So I really thank you, Mark. And I will see you in the community and I'll see everybody else. Thanks for sticking around and joining us. This has been great.